So in this evening's lecture, uh, Crusade in Europe, the home front of holy war in the 12th and 13th centuries, I will consider two main themes. I'll begin by sampling some of the ways in which the medieval crusading past has been remembered in the 20th and early 21st centuries, concluding with discussion of a speech made by President Barack Obama in 2015. At this point, and using some of the responses to President Obama's 2015 remarks as a point of departure, my lecture will turn to the crusading past itself. I will reflect on what we can learn about medieval attitudes towards the practice of holy war by concentrating on the home front of the crusading movement in medieval Western Europe. In May 1941, around 400 feet from the room we are in this evening, bombs fell on the Priory Church of the Order of St. John. As you can see from comparison of these photographs taken in around 1900 and 1941 respectively, the church was all but obliterated during this raid. In the years that followed the destruction in 1941, the order established at St John's Gate the Priory Church Rebuilding Fund. The fund's activities ran for more than a decade between 1943 and 1955 and resulted in the construction of the new Priory Church directly above the medieval crypt that many of you have visited earlier this evening. Among the ways the Priory Church Rebuilding Fund promoted its cause between 1943 and 1955 was a striking poster campaign. This poster depicts a medieval knight of the Order of St. John staring outwards and beckoning viewers towards the ruins of the Priory Church. The remaining wall of the building itself is emblazoned with an eight-pointed cross, the symbol of the Order of St. John. The eight-pointed cross is then replicated and amplified with the Priory Church itself at the centre of the cruciform shape. A caption in the foreground identifies the cause of the damage destroyed by enemy action 1941, while in the background, on the right, the familiar outline of St Paul's Cathedral can clearly be seen surrounded by flames. The knight's gaze is intense, his expression grave, and while his lips are sealed, it is almost as if the poster's succinct call for support is emanating from the knight himself, reaching out from across the centuries, help rebuild. This use of medieval imagery by the Order of St John in the mid-20th century was not particularly new. In a poster produced around 30 years earlier, for example, the ghost of a medieval knight of St. John watches over the activities of two members of the St. John Ambulance Brigade as they provide care for a wounded soldier on the battlefield. The chronology provided at the top of the poster, 1099 to 1914, seeks to provide a further connection between the caregiving practices of the medieval order of the Hospital of St John and their modern day descendants. The fact that the knight is holding his sword by the blade, giving it the appearance of a cross, is striking. Not only does this uh, indicate that the medieval warrior is giving his blessing to his modern counterparts, it also serves as a reminder that as well as providing for the welfare and medical needs of pilgrims to Jerusalem, the medieval brethren of the Order of St. John were committed to performing acts of violence as an expression of Christian devotion. Indeed, the chronology on this poster, which situates the origins of the Order of St. John in 1099, is particularly worthy of note. For although this year holds no direct significance for the Order itself, it was, of course, in 1099 that the armies of the First Crusade conquered Jerusalem and established Latin Christian control over the city. The poster, therefore, not only illustrates the Order of St. John as having a long-standing tradition of providing medical care to those in need, 
It also points to the order's intrinsic links with the medieval crusading movement. These two posters are not the only examples of modern attempts to draw a straight line between the Order of St. John's medieval past and its 20th century present. A third poster, produced at some point in the first half of the 20th century, shows a mounted medieval knight of St. John leading a contingent of men and women from the St. John Ambulance Brigade through a very modern industrial landscape, complete with the slogan, we encircle the world. And more recently, in 1995, the order produced a poster that demonstrates a desire to introduce younger members of St. John Ambulance to their organization's medieval roots. Here, an armed and robed medieval knight of St. John winks knowingly at his viewers as he shares the knowledge of the order's past with two St. John Ambulance cadets. A third cadet is pictured so that we can see over his shoulder. He is engrossed in reading what is identified quite simply as history. Taken together, these posters from across the 20th century point to the Order of St. John maintaining a clear awareness of its medieval and crusading past. Although at points ghostly, the Order's origins in and association with Crusader Jerusalem and its history as a military religious order are commemorated here as an integral part of the Order's institutional memory. These modern representations of the medieval crusading past represent an important starting point for my lecture this evening. And as Abby has already said, you can find out a lot more about these posters uh, and other objects from the collection by visiting our website. Details are all on the uh, bookmarks and on the pencils. And in fact, some of the posters that I've been showing you pictures of are on display uh, in the gallery and museum downstairs. So when seen within the context of other images from across the period 1914 to 1995, there was therefore nothing particularly unusual about the way that the Order of St. John presented itself in this poster from the mid-20th century. And what's more, members of the Order's Priory Church Rebuilding Fund were not the only people to be alluding to the medieval past in the aftermath of the Second World War. One of the most famous early histories of the war was Crusade in Europe, a personal account of the conflict written by one of the Allied military leaders, Dwight Eisenhower, and first published in 1948. This was an evocative choice of title, and although Eisenhower did not dwell on its meaning at great length in the book, he did set out what he intended to convey in using it. Buried within the index as a sub-entry to Eisenhower Dwight D is a single page reference to war, a crusade. The passage in question relates to the outcome of the Tunisian campaign of 1943. Here, Eisenhower recorded his thoughts on a potential meeting with the defeated German commander, Hans-Jürgen von Arnim. And I'm going to quote now uh, from Eisenhower's book. When von Arnim was brought through Algiers on his way to captivity, some members of my staff felt that I should observe the custom of bygone days and allow him to call on me. The custom had its origin in the fact that mercenary soldiers of old had no real enmity toward their opponents. Both sides fought for the love of a fight, out of a sense of duty, or more probably for money. A captured commander of the 18th century was likely to be, for weeks or months, the honoured guest of his captor. The tradition that all professional soldiers are really comrades in arms has, in tattered form, persisted to this day. Eisenhower then went on to draw a sharp contrast between this romanticised view of conflict in what he called bygone days with the stark realities of the war in which he had himself engaged. He wrote, For me, World War II was far too personal a thing to entertain such feelings. Daily as it progressed, there grew within me the conviction that as never before in a war between many nations, 
The forces that stood for human good and men's rights were this time confronted by a completely evil conspiracy with which no compromise could be tolerated. Because only by the utter destruction of the Axis was a decent world possible, the war became for me a crusade in the traditional sense of that often misused word. Eisenhower did not clarify exactly what he meant by referring to the war as a crusade in the traditional sense. Now, it seems unlikely that he was intending to align the Second World War with the history of the medieval crusading movement in any direct way. So in this respect, uh, there's no immediate comparison between the title of Eisenhower's book and, say, uh, the poster of the Order of St. John from 1914, uh, which I've already shown you. Instead, it is probable that Eisenhower understood the word crusade in a more general way to denote a war fought between the forces of good and evil, and both those uh, terms appear in this extract. With this in mind, Eisenhower's aversion to the way the word crusade had been misused presumably relates to the fact that the term had become decoupled from the act of warfare itself, and thus, for him, debased in meaning. He was perhaps thinking about the way the word crusade is still commonly used nowadays, where it is intended to infuse almost any action with a positive moral status. I'm going to give you a few recent examples from a very simple uh, search of uh, newspaper websites. So, on the 11th of September last year, readers of The Observer could consider the psychology of Mrs May and her grammar school crusade. A month later, uh, The Guardian published a story about Clinton's little-known crusade to save Africa's elephants. Elsewhere, the Daily Express has a whole section of its website dedicated to championing consumer rights. It's identified quite simply as The Crusader. The paper's signature campaigns are also commonly referred to as crusades. Crusades on hospital car parking charges, crusades to ensure road improvements, and, of course, Brexit, a very different crusade in Europe to the one Eisenhower had fought. Now, these headlines and slogans are all in keeping with the second figurative definition of crusade given by the Oxford English Dictionary. Here, the dictionary defines it as an aggressive movement or enterprise against some public evil or some institution or class of persons considered as evil. Now, given that this fairly loose and morally positive sort of language and imagery is part of the cultural furniture of the modern world, it's easy to see why Eisenhower was so keen to be precise in declaring the Second World War to be a crusade in the traditional sense. In writing this, he evidently sought to reconnect the word crusade with morally positive ideas and traditions of just war. Five years after the publication of Crusade in Europe, Eisenhower went on to become President of the United States, serving two terms from 1953 to 1961. But he was by no means the last American president to evoke the Crusades in public and political discourse. Two of his more recent successors have in fact been heavily criticised for their use of this particular C word. In September 2001, for example, President George W. Bush notoriously called for a crusade in response to the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Like Eisenhower before him, Bush was intending to draw on the traditional sense of a virtuous war when he stated that this crusade, this war on terrorism, is going to take a while. But his naive use of the word crusade was met with anxiety and condemnation around the world, not least because it was seen to lend credence to the polemics of Osama bin Laden and his followers. Indeed, in an interview recorded in October 2001, so shortly after George Bush's declaration of the war on terror, bin Laden referred to this battle between Islam and the Crusaders. And he went on to describe how 
This is a war which, like previous wars, is reviving the Crusades. Richard the Lionheart, Barbarossa from Germany, and Louis from France. The case is similar today when they all immediately went forward the day Bush lifted the cross. So here, the way the crusading past was made present was very different in tone from the other examples I have considered thus far. Although Dwight Eisenhower and George Bush both used the word crusade without necessarily intending to invoke the Middle Ages, more recently, in 2015, President Barack Obama made a more deliberate reference to the history of medieval crusading. He caused significant controversy in doing so, although for rather different reasons. For unlike his presidential predecessors, who intentionally used the word crusade to denote something they deemed to be positive, Obama's reference to the crusades was decidedly negative in tone. On the 5th of February 2015, at a national prayer breakfast held at the White House, President Obama addressed the issue of how, in the modern world, professions of faith have been twisted and misused in the name of evil. He spoke of the way in which, around the world, faith is being twisted and distorted, used as a wedge, or worse, sometimes used as a weapon. Obama was referring primarily to the actions and ideas of Muslim jihadists, attempting to distance them from the mainstream of contemporary Islam, and arguing that those terrorists who profess to stand up for faith, their faith, profess to stand up for Islam, in fact, are betraying it. He singled out in particular supporters of the Islamic State, whom he characterized as individuals who carry out unspeakable acts of barbarism, claiming the mantle of religious authority for such actions. Obama's message was clear. Modern jihadism represented a twisting, misuse, distortion, and betrayal of Islam. And those are all words up there on the quotations on the screen. But it was what he said next that proved to be particularly controversial when he compared contemporary manifestations of religious violence with those to be found in the medieval and Christian past. He said, humanity has been grappling with these questions throughout human history. Unless we get on our high horse and think this is unique to some other place, Remember that during the Crusades and the Inquisition, people committed terrible deeds in the name of Christ. So this is not unique to one group or one religion. Obama's suggestion that violent acts perpetrated by modern jihadists and medieval crusaders were somehow analogous implied that crusading represented a similar twisting, distortion or betrayal of Christianity, and that it was therefore hypocritical to suppose that Islam was the only religious tradition in which there were intersections between faith and violence. Obama's critics quickly seized upon and condemned his remarks. On the one hand, the president was portrayed as an apologist for Islamist extremism, having supposedly implied that ISIS only existed because of Christian or Crusader provocation. Others took his uh, words as an attack on Christianity more generally. Ironically, some of Obama's critics actually seemed to agree with him, at least insofar as he suggested that medieval justifications for crusading would not be recognisable to or shared by modern Christians. Uh, in an interview for Fox News, for example, the former mayor of New York, uh, Rudy Giuliani, stated that the Crusades did not follow the words of Jesus Christ. They were totally contrary to the words of Jesus Christ. When we see Christian atrocities of a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, we're seeing people who are acting contrary to the words of their founders. The Crusades were clearly, clearly in violation of the religion. The response of Russell Moore, president of the Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, was widely quoted and went further still. 
He characterised Obama's remarks as an unfortunate attempt at a wrong-headed moral comparison. And he made the following conclusion. The evil actions that he mentioned were clearly outside the moral parameters of Christianity itself and were met with overwhelming moral opposition from Christians. And note the use of the past tense uh, in his characterization here. Now, if Moore was thinking about the medieval crusading movement here, his characterization of it was deeply flawed. From the perspective of Latin Europe in the central Middle Ages, the actions of crusaders were not clearly outside the moral parameters of Christianity, nor were they met with overwhelming opposition from Christians. Even the most cursory glance at the history of medieval crusading reveals that these assumptions are simply ahistorical. In the Middle Ages, crusading was authorized by generations of popes across hundreds of years. The practice of holy war was theorized and theologized by some of the medieval church's greatest thinkers, from Bernard of Clairvaux to Thomas Aquinas and beyond. Crusades were preached and led by people who went on to be recognized as saints. And although only a relatively small minority of medieval people might actually have engaged in fighting in the so-called Wars of the Cross, crusading was an activity and an ideal that demanded the support of the clergy and laity across Christendom. On this basis, any attempt to suggest that medieval crusading was the preserve of extremists or fundamentalists who are in any way condemned by the mainstream is misguided. Instead, the crusading project, which was primarily concerned with establishing and maintaining Christian custody of the Holy Land, came to be envisaged as a collective activity to which all medieval Latins might contribute. In this respect, the successes and failures of crusaders in the East were regarded as being intimately linked with the activities of people in the West who were engaged in the home front of holy war. What was this crusade in Europe? Here, the poster produced in the mid-20th century by the Priory Church Rebuilding Fund provides a helpful cue. I have already described how this poster might be understood as a call for aid from the past to the present. But in some ways, the call for aid illustrated here also evokes the way in which, after the conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, Latin settlers in the Holy Land, including members of the Order of St. John, called upon their co-religionists in Western Europe to help rebuild the churches and infrastructure of the reconquered holy places. At some point between 1161 and 1164, for example, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, Amalric of Nestle, wrote to the King of France, Louis VII, to ask him to help rebuild the cathedral at Banyas. Amalric's letter stated that this church once so famous and deserving of all veneration and service, has now been almost destroyed by the Turks. This phrase is itself reminiscent of the 20th century posters destroyed by enemy action. Amalric then described how the church's new bishop was driven by the desire to restore the church to its former glory. Although the new bishop was described as having expended a great deal of effort and much of his own money, he still required the financial support of the French king, which is why the bishop now intended to travel to France to throw himself on your charity, addressing the king of France, and inform you personally of the ruin and poverty of that venerable great church. But the bishop's appeal came to nothing, since in the autumn of 1164, the town of Banyas was reconquered for Islam by the Muslim leader Nur al-Din, and the cathedral was subsequently destroyed. Nur al-Din's conquest of Banyas in 1164 reminds us that it was not just help with rebuilding projects that the Latin settlers in the Holy Land called for. 
The Latins were also heavily reliant on Western Europe for the military manpower and resources required to defend the holy places. From as early as 1100, appeals were sent westwards from the Crusader states that set out the precarious situation the Latins found themselves in. In that year, for example, the Patriarch of Jerusalem wrote a letter to the West in which he stated that, we have confidence in your generosity inspired by the Lord God to give an adequate response to every just request in time of need. For when you learn that Jerusalem the Holy is under attack on all sides from pagans and infidels, it is our hope that you will all come to the aid of this most sacred place of salvation in the time of its extreme need and perilous situation. Come quickly to the aid of God, whose sanctuaries are in danger of being destroyed. There's some evidence to suggest that on occasion, images as well as words were used to stir up support and stimulate crusade recruitment. According to the Muslim writer Ibn Shaddad, in the late 12th century, one of the Latin leaders in the Holy Land had produced a picture of Jerusalem on a large sheet of paper depicting the Holy Sepulchre to which they come on pilgrimage and which they revere. He pictured the tomb and added a Muslim cavalryman on horseback trampling on the Messiah's tomb. Images of the Holy Sepulchre were well known in the West, appearing in manuscripts such as this example from the late 12th century. The Holy Sepulchre also appeared on pilgrim souvenirs, such as this example, which is now in the British Museum. Note the configuration of three towers here uh, and the representation of the conical central dome because it's going to recur in some of the images I'm going to show you next. Um, the Holy Sepulchre figured prominently on the late 12th century coinage and there on the left you can see that image from the pilgrim souvenir echoed in the shape of the dome. And Christ's tomb was also depicted on the seals of the Grand Masters of the Order of the Hospital of St. John, shown here on the right, again with the same configuration of towers and central dome. So because of this familiarity in the West with the images of, Holy, of the Holy Sepulchre, it's perhaps not surprising that a graphic image of this familiar and most holy of sites being desecrated would provoke an emotional response among the Christians of Latin Europe. And Ibn Shaddab went on to suppose how people responded to this image. This picture was publicized overseas in the markets and assemblies as the priests, bareheaded and dressed in sackcloth, paraded it, crying doom and destruction. Images affect their hearts for they are essential to their, their religion. Therefore, multitudes of people whom God alone could number were roused up. Members of the Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem were among those who sent written appeals to the West, informing their brethren of recent developments and raising awareness of new threats and ongoing challenges. In 1201, the master of the hospital, depicted here on his seal, Geoffrey of Donjon, wrote a letter to William of Villiers, the prior of the hospital in England. So William was, of course, based right here in Clerkenwell. The situation Geoffrey described in his letter was bleak indeed. Our enemies exult in great joy, he wrote, because they know we are few in number, impoverished and lacking in arms. Hence we cry to you with our tears, and pitifully we beseech that you see fit to bring your help and advice to us, whether great or small. Geoffrey went on to explain how dependent the hospitallers in the Holy Land were on the income derived from the Order's houses in the West. If we do not receive money from our houses across the sea, we cannot get it from anywhere else, and for some time now, we have received virtually nothing to cover our expenses. Know that we are deeply in debt. In expectation of help from you and our other good brothers, we ask you to send whatever help you can. 
fundraising and providing financial support were therefore key activities on the home front of crusading. The military orders of the hospital and the temple were among the most important players here since they acquired extensive properties across Western Europe during the 12th century, all of which were regarded as sources of income generation for the two orders headquarters in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. And here's the uh, headquarters of the Templars. Writing in around 1170, a German pilgrim who traveled to the Holy Land noted the way that the order of the temple represented a focal point for Western investment in the defense of Crusader Jerusalem. He wrote, this institution has many properties and enormous income, both from this country and from other parts of the world. The institution therefore has many soldiers to defend the Christian's land. Now, John may have had in mind properties like Cressing Temple, uh, an extensive site in rural Essex that was a base for the large-scale production of grain, the profits from which were destined to be spent on military commitments in the east. And here's what it looks like today. The surviving 13th century barns at Cressing Temple point to the order's agricultural focus here. And perhaps when we think of the activities of the Templars in Britain, we should focus more on the evidence that survives above the ground for their practices of estate management, rather than disappearing down rabbit holes in search of secret devotional rituals. The institutional and international networks of the military orders therefore provided important mechanisms for the transfer of material resources between the West and the East. For the wider community of the Christian faithful, demonstrations of financial support for the Jerusalem crusading project could be made in other ways, not all of which were voluntary. In 1188, for example, a tax known as the Saladin Tithe was levied in England and France to assist with the costs of royal crusading plans. The tax demanded each person to give this year in arms for the aid of the land of Jerusalem a tenth of his income. Uh, and exemptions were offered to those who vowed to go on crusade themselves. Those who did not pay ran the risk of being excommunicated. And from the early 13th century onwards, the presence of the crusading movement could be felt right at the heart of Christian Europe's many local communities, the parish church. In 1213, Pope Innocent III instructed that an empty chest must be placed in each church. The clergy and laity, men and women, should put their arms for the aid of the Holy Land into this chest to be spent according to the decision of those to whom this concern is entrusted. Now, in a separate set of uh, related instructions, Pope Innocent clarified how the people of Christendom were to be guided on their use of these uh, crusade chests. And he also uh, offered guidance on the rewards that those who made donations could expect to receive for supporting the crusade. He wrote that all the faithful should be advised to put their arms in it for the remission of their sins. The amount will depend on what the Lord inspires them to give. And this ought to be publicly and repeatedly announced once a week at Mass in all churches for the remission of sins and especially for the remission of the sins of those who make offerings. So in this way, Pope Innocent determined that each and every member of Latin Christian society should be making a contribution to the recovery and defence of the Holy Land in whatever way was most appropriate. As he summarised uh, in these instructions, the clergy of Western Christendom were tasked with encouraging and persuading the faithful so that those who are in a position to fight the war of the Lord take the sign of the cross in the name of the Lord of hosts, while the rest piously donate arms according to their means. These proclamations were, in effect, a direct endorsement of the validity of the home front. However, 
Pope Innocent III was not just intent on involving the Christians of Western Europe in the crusading project through the offer of financial support. As he wrote in 1213, we ought to fight in such a conflict not so much with physical arms as with spiritual ones. Consequently, Innocent's pontificate saw the rolling out of an extensive programme of devotional activities across Latin Christendom, all of which were focused on seeking divine support for and thus lending spiritual assistance to crusaders in the field. One of the most dramatic displays of devotion on the home front of crusading took place in Rome on the 16th of May 1212. At this time, Pope Innocent III produced a document through which he decreed that there should be a general procession of men and of women so that the Lord might be favourable towards those fighting in the war unless God abandon his inheritance to disgrace. The instructions that the Pope provided for this general procession were detailed and extensive the entire Christian population of Rome was to participate in three separate processions that started out to the sound of church bells from three different locations in the city before converging and assembling as one and in silence before the Lateran Palace. The women of Rome were to gather at the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore, they were directed to proceed towards the Lateran behind a processional cross along the Via Merulana, led by the nuns who made up the city's community of female religious. These women were to conduct themselves in a manner that was fitting for this penitential activity. Participants were instructed not to wear gold or gems or silk garments. They were to pray with devotion and humility, with weeping and wailing, and those who could should walk in bare feet. Elsewhere, the procession of Roman clergy began at the Basilica of Santi Apostoli, from where the clergy set out, led by monks and canons regular, and behind a second processional cross. This is the route they probably took. Uh, they made their way southeast, passing the Colosseum en route and climbing towards the Lateran using what is now the Via dei Santi Quattro Coronati. Finally, the laymen of Rome set out from the Basilica of Sant Anastasia, following an object that's referred to as the Cross of the Lord and led by members of the Order of the Hospital of St. John. Their route, uh, which ran to begin with alongside the Circus Maximus, uh, also took them past a number of churches, probably including San Stefano Rotondo, whose round architectural form called to mind the structure of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The laymen who joined this third procession were to conduct themselves just as outlined above, the text says. So this presumably means that like their female co-religionists, the men were to pray, to weep and wail and walk barefoot to the Lateran. <coughs> While these three processions were making their way towards the Lateran, Pope Innocent himself, together with an entourage of senior churchmen, entered a chapel known as the Sancta Sanctorum, the Holy of Holies. From here, he took up a relic of the wood of the life-giving cross, a piece of the true cross, and he then joined the assembly of Roman citizens that awaited him at the Lateran. He displayed the relic to the people and then delivered a sermon. At this point, the assembly of the city of Rome disbanded. The women made their way to the nearby Basilica of Santa Croce in Gerusalemme, the Church of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, where they attended Mass before subsequently returning to their homes. Meanwhile, the men of the city, clergy and laity alike, moved on to the Basilica of St. John Lateran, where Mass was celebrated. This large group of male clerics and laymen, including the Pope, then proceeded themselves in bare feet to the Basilica of Santa Croce, 
where further liturgical activities were performed before the day's events concluded. This whole event must have amounted to a phenomenal sensory and devotional experience. It involved the gathering of large numbers of the Christian faithful, whose devotions were marked by the sounds of singing, bell ringing, weeping and wailing, before eventually falling silent and attending to a papal sermon. The bodies of participants would have endured the heat of the Roman summer and the gruelling pain of a barefoot procession. And the participants' visual focus was concentrated on one of a number of relics of the true cross, as well as a series of churches that evoked Jerusalem, either through their architecture, like San Stefano Rotondo, or through the sacred objects they were understood to contain. So the Basilica of Santa Croce is believed to contain a critical mass of sacred objects relating to Christ's passion. So the whole event was a profound demonstration of belief in the power of intercessory prayer. It also enabled those on the home front to contribute to the crusading cause through participating in a day of religious activity that in some ways resembled the devotional atmospherics and experiences of going on crusade itself. So this procession took place in May 1212, and Pope Innocent evidently deemed the event to have been a success, because in the following year, he determined that it should be replicated and extended across Latin Christendom. He wrote in 1213 that, we decree and command that once a month, there must be a general procession of men separately and where it can be done, of women separately, praying with minds and bodies that merciful God will relieve us of this shameful disgrace by liberating the Holy Land from the hands of the pagans and restoring it to the Christian people to the praise and glory of his holy name. What's more, in the same document which called for these monthly processions, Innocent instructed that prayers for the recovery of the Holy Land should be attended to on a daily basis. And every day during the celebration of Mass, everyone, men and women alike, must humbly prostrate themselves on the ground, and the psalm, O God, the heathens are coming to thy inheritance, should be sung loudly by the clergy. When Innocent gave these instructions in 1213, the idea that prayers said in Europe might have a positive effect on crusaders fighting hundreds of miles away wasn't a new one, but Innocent's institutionalisation of such activities certainly was an innovation. Nevertheless, Innocent was building on more than a century of tradition that had developed in Western Europe. So the population of Europe had grown accustomed to thinking that they bore important responsibility for their Latin brethren who had settled in the Holy Land beyond the sea. To bring things uh, on this theme closer to home, from the mid-12th century onwards, the priors of England, of the Order of the Hospital of St. John, who were based here in Clerkenwell, the priors made a visual declaration of their relationship with the Holy Land on the seals they used to affirm their identity. It became commonplace on the seals of the priors of England uh, for the prior to be de depicted kneeling in prayer before an object that was most likely to, uh, intended to represent a reliquary of the true cross. So here you see a, an individual kneeling, uh, look, looking to the right. There's then an altar here with a cross on top of it. This is probably a reliquary of the true cross. Now the iconography of the seals of the priors of England developed over time. And the connection between the object depicted, the cross, and the Holy Land was elucidated further. By the 1180s, the cross reliquary was shown to be emerging from, and thus indicating it was contained within, a building in the bottom left corner of the seal. And the building resembles the Church of the Holy Sepulchre with its familiar 
uh, conical dome. And there's a kind of zoom out, and you can just compare and contrast the two images on the right, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, as depicted on a coin from the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and there, in the bottom left of the seal, an image uh, that it, uh, it suggests it's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So these seals' projection of devotion from the prior to a distant sacred object, the Jerusalem relic of the true cross, and the projection of devotion to a remote sacred space, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This projection of devotion represented an attempt to collapse the distance between the home front in England and the crusading frontier in the east. We should thus imagine ourselves right now being at a site whose medieval occupants were dedicated not only to sending financial, material and human resources to the Holy Land, but devotional ones as well. To conclude, in this lecture I have argued that there are a variety of ways in which medieval Latin Christians could become involved in the crusading project to secure control over Jerusalem and the holy places without ever leaving their homes in Western Europe. With this in mind, I'd like to return to the 21st century and reflect once again on modern uses and memories of the crusading past. Here, the evidence for the medieval crusade in Europe simply does not support the contention that the practice of holy war was clearly outside the moral parameters of medieval Christianity, or that it was met with overwhelming moral opposition from medieval Christians. Instead, everyday modern uses of the word crusade to denote something believed to be virtuous contain echoes of the way that the practice of holy war was regarded positively by the wider community of the medieval Christian faithful. While most modern Christians would not share these attitudes towards the righteousness of religious violence, to characterise medieval enthusiasm for crusading as a form of medieval extremism is not just anachronistic. It is to misunderstand fundamentally the religious culture of the Latin West in the central Middle Ages. Thank you very much. <clears throat>